All right, fantastic. I'm getting the indication that we are going live. Welcome, everybody uh, that is tuning in to the first Wednesday of the month, the Fire Engineering Hump Day Hangout Focus on Training, uh, where Fire Engineering uh, and the folks that uh, Chief Bobby Halton and the folks at Clarion Events and Fire Engineering partner with the ISR All right, Society, fantastic. I'm getting the indication that we are going to bring you some training content. Uh, my name is Brad French. I'm a captain Hi, in the welcome, Dayton, Ohio Fire Department and uh, former board of directors member for the ISFSI as well. Still heavily involved in the organization. We've got a, a great panel of, our, of some of our typical co-hosts and guests to talk about realism in fire training today um, and, and fire training, various aspects of fire training, certainly live fire training, but maybe we'll take the discussion in other areas as well. But trying to figure out how we get the, the biggest bang for our buck on the fire training ground. Um, we've got some really experienced training officers and training chiefs here. And so we uh, should have a lot to talk about. If you have things that you would like to add to the discussion as we go over the course of the next hours, here, so feel free to do that on social media and use the hashtag FE talk, hashtag FE talk. Um, Joe, one of the folks in the uh, in the background at Fire Engineering, will try to keep an eye on that. And I will as well. If you see me looking down at my phone from time to time, and try to add in some of the questions or comments that we get added uh, from out in the uh, the Twitterverse and the uh, um, the social media world out there. If anybody has any questions or comments to add, um, sometimes Chief Bobby Holton, or uh, as I often called him, our uh, call him our, our uh, elder statesman or our elder in chief. Sometimes we'll we'll jump on. He may at some point. I'm not quite sure if he's going to join us or not. Um, in his absence at the moment, I will go ahead and make the plug for FDIC International 2020. If somehow you have been living your entire fire service career under a rock and have never made it to Indianapolis to the show of shows, uh, FDIC International, make, make 2020 the year. The dates for that are April 20th through the 25th of 2020. The, all of the notifications have just recently gone out to all the instructors for the classroom sessions, for the free conference workshops, for the hands-on training classes. Many of our panel here will be teaching at FDIC as well. Very, very exciting stuff. So please, registration is open. Go on there. I don't think the class lists are necessarily up yet. I don't believe. I'm not quite sure about that. But uh, I know that they're formulating all that stuff as we speak, and the registration is open. So make 2020 the year to get to FDIC International if you never have. And if you have, I guarantee you already know that you want to be back there. We certainly all, all uh, look forward to it every single year. So FDIC.com is the website for that. Uh, so anyway, uh, without too much uh, further ado, I think we'll go ahead and jump into our topic here. As, a, as it often is the case when we speak about things that we're quite passionate about, we fill up a whole hour, no problem. And I have no, no doubt that that'll probably be the case again today. So realism in fire training. As I said, uh, uh, Brad French from Dayton, Ohio, have had the opportunity to be involved in our, in our training division and a lot of the training that we do there, uh, recruit schools, live fire training. We do uh, br bring folks out from the district from time to time and do live fire training. And have also had the opportunity myself to partner with uh, Sinclair Community College, our local community college, actually where I'm set up for this hump day hangout. And we do a lot of live fire training there as well. Um, my experience, at least in, in the most recent sections of my career, has primarily been in the fixed facility uh, environment as far as as far as uh, 1403 compliant burns go. Some of our other panel members do a lot with uh, acquired structure burns. And so we'll definitely want to get a lot of insight on both of those for anybody that's out there and tuned in that wants to hear about some of the best practices on one versus the other. Uh, so with that being said, I want to kind of kick it uh, down the line. Uh, let's do it. Let's just do a quick round of introductions and uh, a little bit about yourselves for maybe those that don't tune into us every week, and then we'll kind of get back into the content from there. So, Aaron Heller, I'll kick it over to you, sir. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to be back again. Uh, my name is Aaron Heller. I'm a captain in Hamilton, New Jersey. Uh, I'm uh, the owner of Onsene Training Associates, and uh, been been teaching at FDIC for several years and, and uh, got my notification. We'll be back running the commercial fire ground ops hot class, as well as a uh, commercial fire ground ops um, one in a, one in 45 minute hour and 45 minute class. So uh, that's where I'm at. And uh, I do have the ability, the, the great fortune that uh, I've gotten to run quite a few live burns and uh, do some stuff in some acquireds. And in fact, we're planning a really big one at the end of this month down in Louisiana. So this is a really pertinent topic for me. All right, fantastic. Uh, Steve Shaw and your cast of characters down there in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. First of all, how's the weather? It's it's 
blessfully, blessfully good. The uh, the hurricane did take a hard right, um, unfortunately, after squatting over the Bahamas. So we all, you know, had those people in our prayers and whatnot. And um, uh, but we we lucked out. It, it made a hard right. It's heading north right now. So the whole South Florida area is breathing a huge sigh of relief. Um, anyway, um, my name is Steve Shaw. I'm the Battalion Chief of Training and Special Operations for Fort Lauderdale Fire Rescue. I'm also the chair of the Training and Education Subcommittee for the Broward Fire Chiefs. And i um, honored to be talking about this subject today, which we're all very passionate about. I have with me my training team, uh, my two training captains, Captain Chris Davis Partridge and Captain Danny Moran, both uh, who have a ton of experience uh, internally and externally doing a bunch of live burns. Um, as we kind of discussed before, you know, we don't have a dedicated training facility in Fort Lauderdale. So we've become, uh, quote unquote, experts in uh, getting acquired structures and training on them on a semi-regular basis. Uh, last thing I'll say is we just got... I think a whole neighborhood full of houses. I'm thinking about I think it's 20 or so houses yes. that we're about to do um, a ton of training out up until 1403 live burn. So this topic comes to the perfect time and we definitely are excited to, to input and uh, help out where we can and definitely glean some information from you guys as well. Fantastic. And Chief Shaw, I'm sure you guys probably use those structures to their to their fullest extent, right? Not just with burning, but with various other drills as well. We are the pre-demolition demolition company. We, we do as much as we possibly can with those structures. And, and at the end of the day, we, we, there's, my goal is to leave like almost nothing left. No windows, no doors, no roofs. We never get that far. But I got to tell you, we try to max out what is given to us because we know how much of a blessing those are. We also know that those wire structures, and if we are able to burn them, are possibly the best training we can give our folk who deserve that training uh, next to it, the real thing. So we take it to limit as best we can. We follow 1403 like the Bible, like the gospel. But we, if we get a hold of those structures, yes, there's a lot of work put into the getting those the paperwork and the liabilities and the, the, the disclaimers and the whole harmlessness. But if it's that good for our crews, we're all in. That's awesome. I love that. I love that. All right, uh, Chief Hopple. That's uh, good morning over here and over the afternoon, other place, but 11 o'clock here in Montana. Um, we're trying to dodge a uh, red flag warning today. We're, we're in pretty bad conditions right now, so hopefully the day goes well. But uh, we just have 2,800 acre fire out our back door, and uh, hopefully we can make it through the day. Uh, it's twice as bad as it was a week ago when that fire started. So trying to battle that different kind of different kind of storm, but uh, we're surviving there. Um, I'm the assistant chief uh, over operations here in Billings, Montana. Um, operations and training and prior to that I was battalion chief of training for six years for the department and been very active on the, the live fire side of things. I'm a lead instructor for ISSFI and also serve as a Western Reason director uh, for that society. So very active on that end of things and follow 1403 very closely and you know I've come up with a lot of ways that we can get to this realistic training yet still 100% comply with 1403. So, you know, it takes a team. Uh, it, it's great to hear from Fort Lauderdale that the fire structure burns that everybody's afraid of. We can get them done. We just got to do it right. Uh, and we can do it right. It just takes a lot of work and we got to be willing to do the work. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, welcome everybody. That we're still doing uh, that. Stuff, so. Well, fantastic. Uh, and and uh, Chief Hopper was nice enough to, uh, uh, I just got a hold of him this morning and I, and I thought, uh, I thought, man, I'd, I'd really like to get um, another another person on our panel today that really is 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 I, I hate to use the term expert in the fire service because I, uh, there's there's it's so dynamic that I don't really think there, there's very few in our industry that truly are experts at at, at anything. But I think uh, Chief Hopple's pretty close to that in, in NFPA 1403, and so I'm very happy to have him uh, join up with us today. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and roll forward into some content. I know there's probably a lot of viewers out there that are interested in what these very experienced training officers have to say about some of the things that they do, some of the tricks of the trade to try to make it uh, the most valuable experience that they possibly can for all those attendees. Um, so Aaron, I'll kick it to you. What are some of the things that you like to do? Um, I, I, I go into as many as you would like, some things that you like to do when you're doing, we'll start specifically with live fire training that you try to do on that drill ground to make it as, as beneficial and meaningful and realistic as you, as you can. Well, I think it's, I have to speak kind of, um, I hate to say this, but from both sides of, of the mouth in a way, because here in New Jersey, we do not do it. You will not get a live burn permit and acquired structure in this state 
there's just I, I haven't seen one in in damn near my career. It, it, when I was a kid, we still got them, but not anymore. Uh, and that is a result of people not following 1403, but not following anything, really freelancing, doing what they wanted and putting people in the hospital. And even worse, we've had some fatalities from it, um, very similar to other states around us. So New Jersey cracked down to the point where we can only burn in approved fixed facilities that are inspected annually by the state of New Jersey Division of Fire Safety. So anyway, um, I get all my experience on live burn stuff through through uh, my company and, and through places that I go to teach. And I've been very fortunate to be able to do that. Um, so maximizing it. The biggest thing is, number one, that we start out by looking at the structure. Is the structure really OK to be doing live fire work in or is this a structure where, OK, we can do some wall breaching, we can do searches, we can do some line flowing. Uh, maybe we can do some roof work, but this building isn't really going to be able to be made safe enough, number one, to meet 1403, and two, just safe enough, the whole re area of it, to conduct live fires in. So to me, that's that's number one, is, is can we do this thing safely? Um, are we able to supply enough water for this to meet the standard? You know, are we out in the country where we need tankers or, or tenders or whatever you want to call them? Uh, or do we have fixed water supplies? Things of that nature. Uh, we take we take a long walk through everything that we do. I, I can tell you, we're doing one in Louisiana the last weekend of September, and we're burning in an old hospital. Um, it's it's an amazing opportunity, but the hours that we have put into this, and I've taken multiple trips there where we videoed the rooms that we're going to burn, where we photographed everything, where we've removed what we know we need to remove to make this a, a 1403 compliant burn. Um, those are the big things is to make sure that you're taking the, the really the pre-planning steps versus just, Hey man, we got this cool building. We're going to burn it for drill night. Let's get some pallets and straw, you know, or God forbid worse, let's get whatever fuel we've got that's still laying around the trailer and we'll just throw it in, you know, because I've seen guys do that as well. Uh, but really to me, the, the origination of this has to be, we have to pre-plan it really, really in depth. And, and obviously we have written plans because that's part of 1403. But before I even get to those written plans, I want to video it. I want to see it. I want to feel it. And we've got to see where, how, and what. Um, and then what goes into that gets even more in depth. But that's, that's kind of how I would start. Somebody calls and says, hey, we've got this house or this whatever. We want you to burn down this, this school or whatever. We want to burn down. We want you know less demolition and removal costs. So we're giving it to you, the fire department. Um, wonderful. Thank you. Now we have to go through this to make sure that it really is appropriate for us to do something and without getting our people hurt and, and creating a legal liability. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, so a couple of things popped into my head as you were making some of your points there, Aaron. One, one of them um, is, 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 and I, I want to hear uh, what, what uh, Chief Shaw has to say on this as well. You mentioned some of the other things that we do in these structures, right? Um, and doing the breaching and the breaking and the various drills and things like that. Does Do you ever find that that then precludes your ability to burn in that structure? Are there certain, I believe there's references in 1403 about wall penetrations and things like that, right? Is it is it is it yeah. uh, an issue to where, oh crap, we've done all this over here. Now we can't burn there. So let's go to this other area. Yeah, that, that's absolutely the case. I mean, uh, you know, we have to look at that because if we're doing a bunch of breaching and breaking or we're removing flooring for, for a RID operation drill or something of that nature, now that precludes a lot of the burning that we would have done. So yeah, we that's why planning it out. And I've been on these where they they guys will be doing this and, hey, we got this house to burn. Okay, great. You get there and they've already done all this other stuff with the house. And now really we shouldn't be burning in there anymore because it, it, it doesn't meet what we what we want to meet the standard and, right. and it's just not safe for us. So yeah, that's, that's a great point that you're making. Yeah. And the, uh, and then something else, for example, when you're going down and, and teaching uh, in a, in a, in a, um, not in your, in your, in your, with your own folks, but going somewhere else. One of the things when we start to talk realism, and this isn't really the cool part of talking realism about visibility and heat and things like that. But I think another issue of realism is crew sizes and response times and things like that. And, and how many times do we see when we start to think realism, how many times do we see in an academy environment or something like that, 
you know, well, we've got engine one, engine two, engine three, and ladder one, and we've got 25 people. What are we going to do with them? And you, if, for next thing you know, your first in attack line looks like a, a, a an infield an infield major league baseball line crew that's got six people on it dragging the line around, and it's like, well, well, wait a minute, that's there's no realism there, right? And so I, I also think it's important for people thinking about realism in the training environment to do what you can to to try to replicate the crew sizes that you'll be dealing with in the real world. You know, it certainly doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have three and four people on on attack hand line. Um, and then and then, uh, of course, then they graduate from the academy or whatever the case may be. And they go out and, and holy cow, it's me and the officer. And that's it. You know. That's, so that's, anyway, that's just, I was just a, just a minor point there, but but true size and also another thing where I think sometimes we miss the boat is staggering a response time. You ever been on a drill ground where it's like, okay, engine one's here and uh, I'm going to count to five and engine two's here and I'll count to five again and ladder one's here, you know, and obviously that sometimes doesn't translate into the real world. So crew size and response times, I think, are a couple of realism points that we need to make as well. Uh, go ahead. Did you have something else there? No, no, I, no, I, I totally agree with that. That, that is an issue. It's like writing your SOP based on the FDNY when you respond with two in a rig. Right. You know, right. Uh, how many times do you see that around the country? So, yeah, exactly. Absolutely, uh, Chief Shaw. Let's roll forward to you. Do you have any thoughts about uh, the, the whole multiple uses for structures uh, uh, that, that we were discussing? And, and uh, if not, go ahead and roll forward into some of the things you guys like to do to up the ante on realism. So, real quick, just to give you a background for Florida. Um, Kind of like Aaron was saying, because of certain incidences, uh, state of New Jersey no longer allowed to be acquired structures. Uh, in Florida, it's a little bit different um, because of some line of duty deaths we had back in 2002, um, specifically John Mickle and uh, I think it was Daniel uh, Michael Bed. Um, an act was signed in 2005, which uh, made 1403 law in the state of Florida. So for us, I don't want to say it's easy, but everybody knows in the state of Florida that if we're going to acquire structure burn, it's 1403 and a story. And what I will say about the people listening uh, over today is that you got to have that one person, at least that spearhead, that that safety jerk that's going to abide by that on a regular basis. And that's me right here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it, to be quite honest. I'm the person that's going to uphold that standard so we can keep doing what we can do for our crews out there in reference to a our structure training for as long as we can. So if I have to make somebody's day or make somebody upset because they can't burn today because no, you can't throw 27 pallets into one room or a mattress or, you know, we can go on and on. I'll be that person. I'm okay. That's why God gave me a big back for daggers. I'm okay with it. It's okay. Um, in reference to uh, realism, I'll let some of my captains talk here, but uh, uh, what are your thoughts on what we've done recently for some, to make it realism for, for burns? Well, when we had the, uh, the cadet academy that just recently went through we did a smudge pod burn inside of one of those acquired structures and what we did is we set up realistic size crews we run with three on an engine and two to three on a rescue company and three on a ladder company we dispatched them in, in normal interval intervals and they arrived staggered so they got there we had a, a backup engine set up with the two water supplies water supplies that are required for 1403 and then the other companies just arrived as they normally would and went to work. So it, it added a sense of realism for them, especially being new hire firefighters, uh, to be able to show up on their first almost legitimate working fire, pulling lines, the importance of forcing entry, and just the whole dynamics of everything. Yeah. Um, also, to make uh, you guys are talking about structures that you use for multiple trainings. So. We're fortunate, like we said right now, we have an entire neighborhood full of homes that we can, you know, destroy one side of the block and burn the other side of the block and you don't really have to worry about it. But, uh, you know, when you do just get that one house, um, we do go in there and do some forcible entry training. We can even breach some walls, but as long as we scab it up, we've done that in the past, especially for some uh, expo burns where we're reusing the room. Uh, we can scab it up and make sure that there's uh, no place where fire can get behind. Um, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to you, you have the stuff in the standard that you need to follow, but at the same time, there's got to be some level of common sense that people need to follow as well. And just think about what would happen if there's a hole in the wall in the room that you're burning, where is it going to go? You know, you got to scab it up and protect it. Oh, great stuff. Great stuff. Um, 
a, uh, a Chief Hopple, we'll, we'll roll forward to you, brother. What are uh, what are some of the things that you found over all of your uh, 1403 compliant burns that you can you can inject or add to try to make it a little bit more valuable for the students? Uh, first and foremost, probably one of the biggest things I find as we go about and teach these classes and 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 go to the departments that are building new facilities and whatnot, and actually look at the case studies. We always the, the common theme is we don't find objectives. They're, they're, they haven't pre-written objectives. What is the objective of the burn? What are, you know? What are we trying to accomplish here? If there's a lot of freelancing. It's basically let's start the fire. Let's just go in there and put the fire out. There's there's no objective to it. Um, you know, there's no pre-plan. There's there's nothing done ahead of time. You know, to meet that objective. Um, obviously, when it comes to fire behavior, if you're trying to teach, you know, water application on on fire behavior, you need to know how your facility works, you know, how each room works, you know, what your fuel packages are to accomplish those objectives. If you're just starting a fire in a corner and tell them to advance the hose line up the stairs and put it out, you know, you're not meeting an objective. And we sway from those objectives. That's where we see the line of duty deaths. We start to sway from that. We do things uh, that aren't in that plan, you know, the pre-plan that we do or the pre-burn plan that we do. I see that at every facility that we go to, that, that that's the story people tell when we go around the room and talk about, you know, close calls, near misses, stuff that's happened there. They, they weren't following an objective. They just wanted to see fire and put it out. So, you know, that that's one of the biggest problems I see, that there is nothing on the pre- the, the, the pre part of that that they're doing, you know, and everything's available to us. We're, we're not, we're trying, we shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. You can go out there. I, I heard you talk about ULFSRI resources, but they've gone out and done all of these different studies on fuel packages and, you know, you know, smoke obscuration, all that stuff has been done. We just need to read those reports and follow them. I mean, this is not new stuff to us. And that's what's the most disturbing thing across the board is we just continue to do this every day, yet the resources that are available to us are endless. We just gotta re invest our time in the research prior, prior to doing these burns. I mean, not just comply with 1403, but learn what people are doing. I mean, learn what information's out there so you can build your objectives and you can produce those as realistic fires as possible, yet stay safe. I mean. The information's there. We just got to be willing to take the time and, and do the research. Yeah, you know that's a great that's a great point, Chief. And I'm glad you you got a, a plug to ULFSRI and some of the work that uh, that, that the team there, um, Mike and Jack and Steve and Dan and, and Robin, the whole team at ULFSRI has done a, a tremendous amount of of work in all kinds of studies, as we're all aware. But as you mentioned, Chief, specifically in uh, a lot of stuff that's been kicked out over the past couple of years, and I believe they did overall. Uh, project was called the training fidelity studies or something like that. Looking at the uh, um, looking at some of the exact things and quantifying in terms of flux and heat release rate and some of the different fuel packages and putting a lot of numbers to some of the things we're talking about. So definitely check that out. And then one other real quick thing as it relates to 1403, in case anybody's tuning in as like a brand new training officer or maybe coming from a place that has uh, relatively limited uh, uh, resources. NFPA standards, somebody from NFPA might uh, might take a swing at me for reminding everybody of this, but you can get on and view any of that stuff for free. Okay, you can't print it, you can't uh, you can't save it and so on and so forth, and rightfully so, but you can create an account on, on the NFPA website and go on and view any NFPA standard at any time and view it. Um, and so there, there really is no such thing as, well, I, I couldn't get to it, right? Just as Just as ignorance of the law is no excuse, as we all know, right? Um, and there have been case studies over the years, live fire training related things, uh, much of which uh, Chief Hoppel, I, I know, is covered in the, uh, the ISMSI 1403 uh, live fire instructor credential program, as a lot of states do in their own 1403 classes. Ignorance of the law doesn't get it done just because there was there's a case study of, in the early 2000s where, um, you know, there were all kinds of crazy things done at this burn and, and a firefighter ended up losing his life and another one was injured very, very severely. And essentially, they were like, 1403, what's that? And, and that's not okay. That's not good enough. Um, and so anyway, that's the, those resources and things like that are available. One of the things that I want to toss out to, now we have a kind of, as I said, what I would consider a panel of 1403 experts here, something that uh, I think Chief Shaw or maybe one, uh, one of the, uh, the, the captains mentioned was something about a smudge pot. So something that we've had the discussion of here several times, and I want to throw out to you guys, 
when is a fire a fire? And what I mean by that is when, when we start to get here in a little bit into some of the common 1403 misconceptions or mistakes, such as using firefighters um, as, as, as you know, using down firefighters for rid evolutions and things like that, um, or using live victims or some of the things that have, have, have long since been banned in 1403, when is a fire a fire? And what I mean by that is I've gone round and round with some of the guys in my organization about a smudge pot. That's a fire. That smoke is smoke, is it not? That's not the same thing as using candy smoke from a smoke machine. And so what are your guys' thoughts? When is when is a fire a fire in terms of 1403? Anybody want to jump on that? Or I, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm crazy for even worrying about that. You know, the, the biggest thing, we have that conversation in every class. It's And when we have that banter back and forth is what is live fire and you know, burn barrels, whatever you want to call them. You know, the thing that we need we need, we need to think about. You know, it's an unconfined. You know, basically, it's a real basic definition. Uh, fire that's unconfined and can travel to other areas of the building. And so we got to look at that pot or that or that burn barrel and the, the products of combustion that are coming out of there. And are they able to travel to other areas of the building? You know, heated gases and whatnot. And that's where I think the crossover is is when that fire can spread other places because of those products or other products of combustion so you're keeping that that pot to a, a level that that's not going to happen it probably okay. be the safest way to say that is it is it 100 percent correct probably not but you know back to you know all the changes that have happened in 1403 specifically the 2018 changes you know 90 percent of them are related to fire behavior and, and teaching fire behavior and understanding fire behavior and anybody that's involved as an instructor on the fire ground truly needs to understand the fire behavior within the structure they're burning whether it be a fixed facility or an acquired structure and can identify when things aren't good i mean that that's one of the biggest changes so we've got to be as instructors identify that i think that may address the smudge problem sure. Sure. Chief Shaw, do you guys, uh, I saw you guys chatting a little bit about that. Do you guys have any, any thoughts on that? Uh, when, when does a fire become significant enough that now, Hey, look, uh, we're, we're within the confines of 1403 here. So we were just kind of talking about the smudge pot. We just did one of those for one of our, our recent, uh, uh, new hire classes, cadet classes. Um, Again, I'm going to start by saying again, I'm the, the safety nerd. I, I, I Listen, if it's on fire, if it's even if it's smoldering, listen, I'm not taking any chances. Yes, people are not going to be happy with that. Yes, I'm going to make sure there's an incident. Though I see there's a safety. There's every check in the box for 14 3. I will not be the one that endangers us losing that ability to train because I decided to play, you know, ah, I don't need to do that today. So that's that's me. Um, and just to talk about the smudge pot, I've heard some interesting derivations of that. We were just kind of talking about this. I've heard of, to get away from the standard, oh, let's put it outside and we'll pipe in the smoke through a corrugated tube into a hole. And I'm like, what's happening here? So I've heard some interesting derivations of this. Uh, and and I, maybe I'm the wrong person to ask because I'm a very simple I'm a very simple answer. Um, and these guys will chime in a little bit, but it's a no brainer. Well, gonna... Some of the safeguards, I mean, if, if, if we're trying to be as compliant as we possibly can be, some of the safeguards that are in place in 1403 are not only for the, uh, the the actual fire itself, but are the IDLH involved in in the smoke, right? And so, I mean, if we're using, if we're burning legit stuff in a smudge pot and it's making smoke that could be obviously, uh, you know, a, a significant hazard to those folks in there, I realize that the fire may not be there. And and I'm not trying to debate you guys on this, like I sometimes have had to do uh, with, with with some of some of our folks, but. If 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 the, the smoke is is toxic, right? Then I think I feel like at that point we should be starting to consider all of the normal safety things that we would consider otherwise. All right. Um. Anybody, anybody else yeah. have any more I, thoughts I, on that? I, I'm maybe just I, maybe I've beat that to death. No, no. I I think you're. I think you've got it. It's it's an important discussion to have because I've been to places where I've been told, no, no, we don't have to worry about all that other stuff because we're just using a smudge pot. Right. And and sometimes a smudge pot is, you know, two pallets cut up in it. And right, the next thing right. you know, we're producing BTUs that we weren't really mm -hmm. thinking we were supposed to be producing. So I, I I think it goes back to a couple things. One is you err on the side of caution because from a from a risk management standpoint and a liability standpoint, which is not something that I'm really a fan of. But when I'm doing this as my private company, I'm really 
<laughs> concerned with. Uh, but I, I think you have to err on the side of caution. And secondly, as as I think Chief Hopple posted, put out, and I, and I really believe strongly in this, is you've got to plan that out way ahead of time. And I know that's what Steve does and the guys in Lauderdale are doing too, but you can't just, ah, hell, we'll just fill this bathtub with some stuff and we'll smudge pot it. Because I've, I've seen guys want to do that. And the next thing you know, it goes from one thing to the next thing and we just keep escalating what we're doing. And the next thing, you know, bad things are probably starting to go, you know, go on. It, it's that runaway train and it, and it happens. We, we, we get the blinders and well, we got away with that one. So now we can get away with this one and this one and this one. And the next thing, you know, that whole, that whole normalization of deviance concept. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Not my favorite term, but yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, all right. Well, well, good. Um, so so I want to move forward into and we've already touched on some of this, but maybe get a little bit out of uh, out of each of you from some common 1403 mistakes. And that can either be something that maybe you've seen without without indicting anyone, obviously, personally, but uh, maybe some crazy things that you've seen over the years that were major no no's that you would want everybody uh, that's tuning in to know, hey, stay away from this. Um, or maybe certain case studies. I mentioned uh, I mentioned the uh, the the. Uh, New York case study from back in the early 2000s and one of the burns that had gone very wrong there. And I know Chief Shaw mentioned uh, um, some incidents that they had down in Florida, and there are several. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I think it's important that anytime, anytime we start to talk about line of duty deaths or any actual incidents that have really happened, we do so in a respectful manner, but also with the realization that that's how we learn a lot of times in this uh, industry is to study those things. So whether it be a national incident or kind of a local thing, what are some some no nos on 1403 that you've seen and, and everybody needs to be reminded of. Aaron, what do you think? I, I think that it, there's a few things. Uh, one is absolutely what fuels we're burning. Um, you, you can't burn things that are going to create unknown results. Uh, how many how many investigations have shown that it was couch cushions or that? You know, it was polystyrene thrown into the fire and, you know, it started with, again, good intentions of some straw, some some straw and, and a little bit of, of normal lumber. And the next thing you know, it, it they threw in the couch cushions or they where they decide they would gas it up a little bit with a little bit of combustible fluids of whatever, whatever that may be. Um, and there are still some burn facilities, fixed burn facilities that will use combustible fluids in their burns. I know of some, not in New Jersey, but in places close to here that I've seen. Uh, so I think the fuel load is really a big mistake that has happened. Uh, the other thing is not knowing, uh, really not knowing what, what flow you're gonna have with that fire. You know, where are the products combustion going? How is this ventilation happening? Uh, those are mistakes that have happened. I've got a good friend that was involved in a burn in a, in a in a southern state, and and this is a squared away chief, man, and this guy's done a lot of burns and acquireds and so forth. And one of them went really, really wrong. And when they went back and they investigated, and, and thank God for this guy, he videoed everything. He videoed his safety talk. He videoed the safety walk around. He videoed the writ. He videoed the backup lines. So they had great documentation of it, which is something that I do at all my burns because I learned from that. Um, yet there was an issue where the vent hole just wasn't big enough for the fuel load that they had put in that building. And a guy went to the hospital with third degree burns and, and it was bad. Thank God he lived, but it was bad. So that, that's the kind of errors that I've seen, you know, and then if you go back and you read it and, and I'm not going to throw them under the bus, but there was one in New Jersey where there were welded doors shut on a school bus and they burned it. And then that is why we don't burn in New Jersey. I, I, we're paying for the sins of, of the past. And I, you know, here it is probably 30 years later and we're still paying for them. So we, you're right. Learning from those mistakes. And, and that's, you know, you talk about the fi the fires down in, you know, the burn in Florida where, uh, uh Mickle and Begg were, were, uh, lost. A lot was learned from that great. I mean, tremendous people that ran those burns, people who I would crawl in any fire and ever with those guys. And, and to this day still, and, and, and call them dear friends. But there were some mistakes and they they showed what happened and what went wrong. And, you know, we don't use um, we don't use live live victims as writ in live fire. Obviously, we don't use uh, dummies dressed in in fire gear right now. So we're learning. We, you know, hopefully everybody learns from from what goes wrong. 
Absolutely. And, and and you reference a couple of what I would absolutely consider, as I'm sure the whole panel would, some of the most important uh, case study incidents uh, as, it, as it relates to this. Uh, Chief Hopple, what, uh, with all the, all the 1403 instruction you do through the ISFSI program, what are some of the things that uh, um, maybe some crazy questions you've gotten asked in class, can we do this or, or whatever, or some things in your experience that you found that are common mistakes that are go against 1403? Uh, this is something we're probably going to keep repeating, but this again a big one: fuel loading. You know, fuel loading the rooms, what we're what we're putting in the rooms, the fire behavior component, a burn sequence chart. If you're doing several burns throughout the day, you, you know, you want to have an, you know, a plan of you know which room you're going to burn in first, and so on and so forth, and what that building's designed for, because always we know buildings preheat, fire conditions change, um, so that that's a big one. Is like you know where do we start our fires, or how does the day look? Um, some of the biggest common mistakes. You know, this is th this one here, the ignition officer. I don't know. <laughs> this is one of the changes in the 2018 is that ignition officer can't serve in that role for more than one evolution. In my own department and every department we've gone to, that that has been a common mistake with, with everybody. And we still see people trying to get by that rule, but um, he is that, is most, Chief, is that more than one consecutively or for the day? One consecutive. He's got to okay. be pulled out after an evolution to, to uh, rehab or cool down in that situation. Obviously, we know there was a, a line of duty death in a fire training academy sure. just because of that. Um, so, but everybody wants to be the ignition officer. Everybody, as an instructor, we want to be in it. And we want to see the fire start. And uh, it's, it's, it's a great training opportunity if you're going to use students in that role. But We've, we've got to abide by that. We've, we've had some pretty close calls prior to getting involved in 1403 where that ignition officer came out and altered level of consciousness, not making right decisions. You know, heat, you know, that heat stress, heat stroke, it, close to heat stroke. It, it's, it's dangerous. I mean, and so we have to recognize that. And it's, it's very hard in some of these departments that are manpower limited. It's like, how do they do that? How do they accomplish it? Well, you accomplish it by either doing less burns. You don't ignore that rule, no matter how you how you look at it. You have to abide by that. Um, moving right into that, we talked about gear a little bit earlier. Some people have academy gear. It doesn't meet the the same expectations that we that we put the gear, the gear we put on when we go on a call. Uh, it's like we have separate gear, and that that shouldn't be the case. That needs to meet the exact same standard as the gear we're using. I mean, I, I've seen people that have 20 year old gear because they don't want to get their good new stuff dirty. I mean, that, that that's a, a common denominator, especially in recruit schools where we put them in, you know, use gear for cold evolutions, which, which is fine, obviously to tear up the gear because recruits tear up gear. But when we actually start to do the, the live burns, we need to be fully compliant. And there are many departments that still aren't when it comes to that. And they want me to bend the rules when we come out for these classes and when we tell them that they can't can't attend they're pretty upset and so that it's that, that's a hard one to argue with them but it should be pretty common sense talked about live victims um absolutely you're not gonna get me to sway on that one <laughs> uh, live victims is just bad practice um you know it, there's so much potential there with with cancer in the fire service everything that we have you know even rip training you have the potential to pull a mask off, whatever it is, ingest those gases. It's, it's, it's just not an option. We, we, can, we can train in different environments without live fire and accomplish the same goal as Pete Van Dorp would say. I won't use the words he would say, but uh, we can make it happen uh, and, and get some realistic training when it comes to RIP without live fire. Um, the dummy situation, that's, that's still a questionable one for me. Because in the standard, it does allow us to use dummies dressed in firefighter gear. It just has to be distinguished to be different from the other gear, whether it's painted orange or, or what it is. But then I think we're defeating the purpose of looking for you know, that dummy. Because obviously, we've lost people in training due to dummies being used, live dummies being used in situations, and regular dummies being used in situations. So they had a they had a, a mannequin placed on the floor and everybody passed over the guy that really needed help because they thought it was the mannequin. So there, there's a lot of uh, a background on that and why they changed that in the standards. So we, we still have to discuss the addressing the dummies and fire gear, I think. I think we got work to do on that. 
Outstanding. I appreciate it, Chief. What, uh, um, Chief Shaw, what are, what are some of your guys' thoughts down there from some things that you've seen that uh, um, you, you think, oh, geez, I, I can't, believe they, can't believe they did that. I wish they wouldn't have. Kind of, kind of 14 or three mistakes. Yes, well, well, kind of off of what the Chief was just saying about personal health and, and safety. Um, a lot of people don't want to get vitalized before and after these burns. And we operate in a much different environment here in South Florida. It's 100 degrees outside some of these days with 100% humidity. So really, it, when, when you're at these temperatures, you're limiting the number of burns you should be doing during the day or the intervals in between the burns. And people just want to keep staying in, in the burns. And, and rightfully so. We all got in this career for a reason, to be firefighters and to see fire. But that's one of the biggest issues we see uh, on here. Yeah, uh, pre and post vitals, uh, you know, reports about somebody going home and not waking up the next morning and uh, they were involved with some kind of lab fire evolution the day before. Uh, you know, we really pay attention to that. Uh, one thing that Chief has mentioned uh, a couple of times is the objective of the live fire evolution. So, you know, yeah, what, what are you doing? Is it to go in there and put a room of contents fire out or are you going in there and watch live fire behavior and see it grow from the start? And that's all stuff that needs to be talked about in the walkthrough along with um, is there a victim? Are there mannequins? And, and how many of them? Where are they? Where where are you making entry and where is your exit? Um, you know, like the smudge pot that we just did again with uh, even like instructors, right? So uh, what's your number of instructor and student ratio? Yeah. Uh, one thing you can't deviate from, you need instructors for certain positions. And some people say, oh, we're not really doing a live fire evolution. It's just a smudge pot. So, you know, we don't really need an interior safety guy. Well, no, you do. If you're lighting a fire in a building, it doesn't matter if it's in a smudge pot barrel or if it's a, a, a hay and pallet stack. If you're lighting a fire inside, we need to stick to those ratios and, um, and just police ourselves better. The good thing about in Fort Lauderdale about all these burns that we've done with our expo is that people who aren't even live fire certified, they know when something looks right and when it doesn't because they just have a lot of experience in helping us out. So even like the smudge pot burn that we just did for this cadet class, we had people come out that aren't live fire instructors, but are always in attendance, helping us out prep and do the expo. And they know exactly what we need, what we need to have done without us even telling them. So uh, it's another good thing, you know, that we're very fortunate here and having the experience of doing live burns, not only in, um, you know, facilities, but in the acquired structures where it's, we've been so fortunate out here the last 10 years. I, I will say something about, um, you mentioned, you know, one of the common mistakes, I will say, from my vantage point, being that that safety guy in the or safety person, um, and being out there trying to make sure that everything is followed through is the potential for mistakes. In other words, no, so and so, you can't throw the mattress in there, or no, you can't put twenty people in the room. I, I can't have that, or no, you can't have that crew. Look, I don't know who these people are; they're not on my list. So it kind of goes back to just making sure that things are getting done. It's not a matter of not trusting anybody. It's just you mentioned normalization of deviance. I love that you mentioned that. Um, but having the wherewithal to make sure that things are going right, that you're avoiding those mistakes. You know, if it, one thing to start off right, but as it progresses, uh, at least from my vantage point, sometimes during the day, during the evolutions, you start seeing, well, can we cut that corner? Can we maybe do this? Maybe I can dress up and act as a, a man, a, a dummy. That's when you have to, as the day progresses, kind of watch and keep an eye out. It has to be the same watchful eye from, from the first second you start all the way through the day. You have to have that person or somebody in that safety role and take it seriously. They can't be that person that's going to be swayed by others, let's say. Right. That's Absolutely. You know, something that something that this discussion kind of brought up in my my head, and I've I've probably have gone on this tangent several times over the years uh, in some of our training discussions. Um, but and and I would be imagine that the rest of the panel would agree. But I think as time goes on and we start to um, not only do we have some case study uh, examples of fire ground line of duty deaths where firefighters have, have essentially died with a, a hose line in their hands, but, but, but especially with the progression of modern fuel loads and things like that, I think the, that, that as training officers, training chiefs, training officers, training captains, we have a duty and responsibility to as much as possible try to promote 
seeing these evolutions through to completion, right? I think that there is a big, big hazard in, in the old, well, I'll go in there and give it a couple of squirts and then let it build back up and then hand the nozzle off to the next firefighter and then let him give a couple of squirts and, and let it build back up. And, and I'm definitely huge, uh, just like I'm sure a lot of you are, are, are on the concept of muscle memory and, and, and something that we implemented uh, in Dayton Fire Department and our training division uh, a couple of recruit classes ago is that th there is no go in, squirt, squirt, you know, wave it around. Okay, nice job. Now, next person up. Okay, now you do a Z. Okay, okay, great. Now the next person, you do an N, right? No, none of that, right? Uh, you know, and I mean, very, very early on, maybe doing some nozzle work or something, that's one thing. But when it gets to scenario time, it is you see it through to completion. As soon as you see fire, you open that up, you move in, you do it until there is no more fire. There's no rebuilding. There's no let it let it stoke back up because that creates poor muscle memory. Right. And and so we see the entire thing through to completion to the point that just for a simple, simple room and contents thing that we've, we've added like a, a, a ceiling prop to where after a knockdown, they'll go through and pull the ceiling. And then we bring in the cans and the scoops and the fans and the lights. And every single recruit ends up having essentially what is their own room and contents fire that they see through from pulling the, the line off and, and charging the line at the door all the way through literally to overhaul and clearing the, the place out with a fan because that creates the muscle memory that we want them to have on the fire ground. And, and we've got to be real careful about that and just just do it a little bit and then and then uh, and then let it build back up. Right. And, and certainly I'm not the first one to bring this up. This is something that gets talked about in instructor circles um, all the time and for several years. And we just need to continue to be champions, um, in my opinion, of seeing those evolutions all the way through to completion. Sometimes it means more work. Sometimes we may get fewer evolutions in. But I think the benefit in muscle memory is tremendous. So any, any thoughts on that? You guys uh, agree or disagree? Well, I, I've run into it. I've run into it in live, live burn scenarios, not probie schools. Guys had already been through a probie school. We were burning in a school, literally a school facility that was going to be torn down. Uh, it was a compliant 1403 burn. Fuel loads were good. Nozzleman came in. Line is moving into the classroom nicely. And the nozzleman gives it a quick open shot. And I said, what are you doing? Open up. He goes, no, that's how we did it in fire school. We open and shut. And no, no, no. I want you to put the fire out, you know, but that was his muscle memory. As you keep saying, Brad, that was his muscle memory. So if that's what you're going to teach in, in, especially in um, fixed burn facilities, because that's where we're seeing the most of that type of training, unfortunately, at least in my area, uh, that's what you're going to get. And these guys are going to get themselves in a good house fire where there is some clutter or there's some content or whatever there may be. And now that open shut, you're going to get somebody killed. I mean, it's just the bottom line is, and or you're going to have a captain or a lieutenant screaming at somebody, open the damn nozzle. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the gallons per second is real and we have to show it in everything we're doing. So if we're not showing it, you're right. The bad muscle memory comes open, close. Okay. Now I'll hand the nozzle to the next person so they can open and close that it defeats what we're doing. But I understand a lot of the time constraints that a lot of these academies have, especially I find in, in like the, the volunteer groups where they're doing it at county, local county academies here in Jersey, they've got a certain amount of hours they're trying to cram in and they are pushing and it's not always producing the best nozzle firefighter because of that. And, and that's, that's a problem. We, it's a problem they should be addressing. Some are, some don't care. So, but yeah, that, that is huge to me. Right. Make sure the muscle memory is the right one. What, uh, uh, Chief Shaw, Chief Hopple, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, we do the same thing. If we're going to start a fire and we're going to teach nozzle, you know, water flow and, and put the fire out, we're going to make them do it start to finish. We all know how time consuming that can be rebuilding fires and limited, you know, amount of people. So we'll, we'll do as much as that as we can, but I'm going to, it might, this might segue in right to one of the other topics that you had that you wanted to talk about. And that's the digital panels. Um, when I first saw, saw these come out, I says, absolutely not. No way. We're not moving to digital. Uh, it's just not going to work. So we demoed a couple in our burn facility, put them up, and 
if you want to be able to teach that muscle memory, you, you don't have the heat, but if you want to teach that muscle memory and apply water and as much water as you need to, that's the tool. If, if and you want repetition, you can do hundreds of repetitions during the day and flow the appropriate amount of water and control the panels to that fire is not going to go away until you can see proper nozzle technique and prop, proper water application. So that is where their use in yeah. the fire service is. Chief, Chief, I agree with you hundred percent. And that does absolutely segue into, into uh, a little bit of a chat about that. And um, you know, again, it's not any particular company. I'm not even quite sure who all makes these things. And so that's, that's neither here nor there, but, but that technology, I had a very similar experience that, that you just described. I, when I started seeing those things on the show floors at, 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 at events and things like that a few years back, I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me. This is ridiculous. I mean, what this is embarrassing. I'm embarrassed to even be standing here. But then you're right. You get that into an environment where you can then get some some fake smoke, some thick fake smoke in there. And there's 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 audio that goes along with it. You can hear the fire. We all know of, of regular fire, real life fires that we've been in. A lot of times, what do we do? You you hold your breath for a second so you can listen for the crackle and stuff like that. You shut your flashlights off so you can look up for the for the kind of faint glow. You know, we all know what it's like to be in real fires. It ain't like it is on TV, right? And so you can, that environment with really thick piped in um, fake and safe, right, as an added bonus, fake smoke pumped in really thick to decrease that visibility and then using those panels, it does. You're right. You miss the heat unless you get crazy and you know, whatever, throw a couple of torpedo heaters in there or something like that. But um, you, you do miss the heat component to it. But I agree with you 100%. I was won over, personally was won over by those machines uh, after several times of using them. And I don't think if, if there's anybody out there that, that is, sees those things and thinks, oh, I'd never do that. You know, we're, we're rough and tough. We train with real fire. I get that. And so do we. But I'm telling you, um, even even for the for the for the the, the best uh, and and best training officers out there that try to strive for realism. Don't write off those uh, digital panels until you use them. Um, what uh, uh, Chief Shaw or, uh, or uh, Captain Heller, any thoughts on the panels or goods, goods or bads or, or any other simulations of any kind? Actually, one of the uh, FE talk items on, on Twitter was related to simulations. Any thoughts on digital panels or any kind of simulation use? Yeah, I had the same. I had the same thoughts you had, Brad. When I first saw them, I thought, "Jesus, here we go again with another gimmick and, or and another gadget." Um, we used them down in Louisiana one time for a, a writ under fire type drill without real fire. Um, we we were set up in a barn with a great maze and, and a great scenario, and I was really really impressed at how well that panel worked for us in that scenario. Uh, that with a smoke machine really did do a good job. So. Um, it's not my go-to if I can do live fire or whatever the case may be, but here in New Jersey where I can't, you know, if, but I got an acquired literally in 15 minutes, I'm going down the street with our training captain to go look at an acquired. We just got big two and a half story wood frame. So what are we going to do? We can't burn in it. We can run our smoke machines. And if we had one of the panels, it does add to the realism. It gives crackle. It gives some little different vision, whatever the case may be. I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater on that one. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Uh, the, the I said it's better than an orange cone with a flashlight. Over over in the corner, you know, we've all we've all seen that one before as well. Chief Shaw, what are your uh, what are your thoughts on any kind of digital prop use or, or any kind of other simulations? I mean, here, even some that I've even seen like virtual reality stuff and, and things along those lines. Do you have any thoughts on on some technology use? So definitely not opposed to it. You know, you have to do what you have to do with the the resources that at hand. Um, I'm sure that at some point we will look into that as we go along with the fact that we're getting fewer and fewer acquired instructors. We got to have the next evolution in our training. I'm not opposed to it, and, and a couple reasons why. I mean, if you think about uh, think about a fire, think about arriving on scene in a single story, single family CBS structure with heavy smoke and flames showing from the Alpha Bravo corner. It's already piped out the window. It's already showing doors on, let's say, the Alpha Delta corner. Well, right there, that's the easiest fire you're going to have. You know where it is. You open the door. You know how to get there. You're going to drag a line through the hallway. You're going to put it out and end the story. But take that one step down where let's say you have the same fire where it hasn't busted through the window yet. So the house is completely charged with smoke, full of heat. And you have to actually think now. You have to do your 360 where it really matters. You have to think about when you're going in that structure, as Aaron was talking about earlier, using your senses, 
listening, feeling, maybe using a tick. So I'm not opposed to those, uh, uh, I guess, digital, uh, I don't know what you call them, the screens or whatnot, because if used with the right teaching, with the right instructors, and with the right objectives, as we were talking about earlier, that, may, that makes for a really good scenario if done the right way. And I think it's also a culture change. I mean, if I brought up one of those right now and put it in a house, I, I might get some funny looks from the folks that uh, we work with over in Fort Lauderdale. You know, we're, we're blessed to have a lot of acquired structures. So if I put one of those in the corner, I'd be, I'd have, I, I would write down the, uh, the responses and send them to you via email. But, uh, they, but they'd be so excited you weren't hammering them on 1403 stuff for the day that it might be worth it. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I think it's, um, I, I'm definitely uh, I'm not opposed by any means. I would love to try right. them out. I have not personally looked into them yet. We haven't had a need to yet. But um, that's one of those things where I, I like to see where it goes. In the you, ever, you, you guys ever get any uh, opportunity to do uh, uh, a, an acquired high rise? I mean, that might be a good uh, a good application for something like that as well, right? Some place where, where, where burning is probably not going to be a possibility. We actually had that opportunity several years ago through our through our expo, as Danny mentioned earlier, over at the old Hojo's in the beach, right? Yeah. And I think they were doing live fire there as well. Uh, oh, wow. Two, nice. That, that was a while back. Um, but like you said, the, you might be given one of those structures that you think, wow, this is a great structure. It's relevant for the, the, the kind of construction or occupancy that we see. And yeah, we can't light a fire in it, but you know what? Our, our folk need to know how to navigate through these. So there is definitely an application for something like you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, we are, we're kind of getting, uh, believe it or not, we're already kind of getting towards the end here. So with our last few minutes, I want to kind of go down the line once and any, any final thoughts that have been bouncing around in your head that you want to get out to the viewers before we sign out for the day. Um, this is your chance to do so. So, uh, Aaron, what do you, what's, uh, what do you got, brother? Well, I think, uh, my first thing is don't fear it. Uh, if you've got the opportunity to use them, even if you can't burn in them, then use them for ventilation training, you know, use them for uh, salvage and overhaul type training. Use them, show people how to open up walls properly, how to dress windows. Champo has a great video that was just on uh, fireengineering.com training minutes about, about cleaning windows and, and trimming windows. So do everything you can. Like Steve said, when he gets done, the wrecking crew basically has, all the real work has been done for him. So do that work. Uh, the other last thing for live burn stuff is make sure you're budgeting in that you need a bunch of ticks there if you're going to be doing live fire stuff. Because ticks are the godsend for us now, uh, especially as instructors. We can watch what's going on. We can watch airflow. We can watch where this fire is moving and so forth. Proxy combustion are going. Uh, to me, I'm utilizing my tick inside way more than I ever did. So that, that would be something. But don't be afraid of it. Just read the standard, get familiar with it, and work with it. it it's, it's not an unworkable standard. And be creative. You know, think outside the box. That's, that's the key. So that's what I've got. Thank you. Fantastic, brother. Chief Hopple. I'm just going to wrap this up like I do everything, and I can't emphasize enough. I mean, what we're doing right here, this is what we should be doing across the fire service, networking, talking to other people. I've, in this short hour, I've, heard, I've learned a couple things myself that I can carry on. So if we fail to network or fail to, to utilize the tools that have been provided to us by all the organizations out there, we're, we're failing ourselves in the fire service. So it's invaluable. Reach out and, and work together so we can we, we can accomplish effective training. That's my that's my stance I'll take across the board as a training officer. Nothing I I don't like to reinvent the wheel if it's already been invented. So um, uh, good stuff, brother. Uh, Chief Shaw and uh, and to, to, to both captains. Thank you guys both very much for your contributions today. Fantastic stuff. What are some final parting thoughts? Just real quick on my end, um, Chief Hopple, I agree. I think that the network and the sharing knowledge is huge. Um, you know, we're blessed to have the ability to do a fire structure burns. Uh, if there's anybody out there that would like a copy of our procedures, our SOPs and how to do it, I am more than willing to share that. We're very proud of what we do in Fort Lauderdale. We're very proud of our organization and that we do things the right way. So if anybody wants those, they can absolutely email me or touch with me anyway, and I will make sure those are available to you. Is there anything? Um, one thing I was going to say is in, in the last few minutes, I think, you know, talking about 1403, uh, what the chief has said about uh, muscle memory and the objective, I think that's really what we should hammer home. We were just, we we're, I was laughing when, you, you know, guys heard about muscle memory. We were just talking earlier this morning about a case where FBI agents were in a shootout with some bank robbers. You know what I'm talking about? So they were found, <laughs> they were found deceased in the street with their shell casings in their pocket of their shirt. 
and everybody was wondering why do they why do they have the shell cases? Because that's what they practice at the range. They had to shoot, they had to fire their weapon, and they had to pick up all their shell casings. So when it came down to it, muscle memory, uh, you basically play as you train. And those guys were, you know, in a battle, and they ended up picking up their shell casings just as they'd done in training. And when we go back to what the chief was talking about with the objectives of the burn, like why are you doing this fourteen on three burn? Is it for fire behavior? Where we're doing squirt, squirt, don't put it out, pass it to the next guy. Or is it, hey, there's a fire in this building we're going in and, you know, we're making a full evolution out of it. And I want you to go in there and attack the fire as you normally would. Um, you know, I, I know a guy that, um, you know, his first fire after the fire academy, his officer pushed him down the hallway and said, hey, there it is. Go get it. And he, he brought his hose line into a room that had flashed over and he sat down on the ground and he was waiting for the officer to come in behind him. And, you know, almost like the fire academy, like, hey, here's the room. Everybody come in gather around and let's watch it and then we're going to put some water on it and then back the line out and uh you know i guess at some point muscle memory goes away when your ears start melting so that's when he realized that he needed to open up the nozzle and he ended up with fire it, he came right out and and said that you know i felt like it was a fire academy i went in there and i was waiting for other people to come in the room and i was waiting for somebody to tell me to put water on it and how much so like the chief said i think uh, muscle memory and the objective is it a fire behavior or are we actually going to put the fire out to train like we're going to put the fire out? And, and that's one of the things yeah. that we get to see here being training officers is seeing them go from fire academy to now they're in a realistic, a, a little bit more realistic of a situation and uh, transitioning them from having to search like this where they can't let go of this guy to doing a real actual legitimate search and some of the tactics that we uh, initiate out there in the field. So getting to see that and putting an element of realism to get them out of that fire academy mentality um, for certain things, but for the most part to ha have them safely operate and understand what they're going to be able to expect out there when it really happens in real life. Absolutely. And, I, and I'll tell you, uh, Cap, you bring up that story about the uh, the police officers. I, I, I tell a, a, that story and another similar one about muscle memory and things like that in classes a lot. And, and it just underscores how critical it is our job as training officers to try to put those people in a situation where when when they're in that stress when they're in that moment of panic and stress they default their brain just unconsciously defaults to how they were trained right and so that it just really underscores the importance of what we do um the only other random rapid fire concept that uh, i, I kind of forgot to say earlier um in the section on common 1403 mistakes um make sure you keep in mind that there are certain topics that you need to cover in a training program sequence before you get to a live fire right when we're starting to talk about academies and things like that you can't you know if you as a training chief or a, or a supervisor are getting some schedule or something like that for a firefighter one or firefighter two class going on and like day three is a live burn, like you need to be asking some questions, right? There's a there's a specific set of information in 1403 that needs to be covered prior to, to doing any uh, live burns. And it's important that we make sure we do at least establish some of that requisite foundational knowledge before we start to take them out and put them into that stuff. And that's not even, we didn't even have time to get into some of the other things that we need to make sure we're doing with fire, right, in terms of using some of the small scale props and all that kind of stuff for live fire training and and and, and really using those props to kind of um, plant the seeds of knowledge um, early on in their careers uh, before we even maybe get into some of these live, uh, live fire acquired or fixed facility burns. So anyways, we could go on about this stuff for a long time. It's been a fantastic uh, uh, slightly over an hour having a chat with all these fine training officers from across the country. Um, thank you all very much for tuning in. We will be back uh, first Wednesday of the month for another focus on training. Thanks very much to the Clarion Events Group and Fire Engineering family, Chief Bobby Halton um, and the staff uh, for another opportunity to do this. We will see you back here again the first Wednesday of next month. I'm Brad French from Dayton, Ohio. And on behalf of all the rest of the panel, thank you very much and have a good rest of the day.